Squad Car 37 Live will begin momentarily. In the meantime, see if you can name this tune. Leave your answer in the comments below. Thank you for joining us. Squad Car 37 Live will begin momentarily. In the meantime, please enjoy this musical interlude. If you haven't already done so, please like, subscribe, and follow Tom Schweitzer and A Place to Be. Squad Car 37 Live will begin momentarily. In the meantime, see if you can name this tune. Leave your answer in the comments below. Hope you enjoyed the previews. Squad Car 37 Live will begin now.
Hello, good people. I'm JP, and you are watching Squad Car 37 Live. And I have a very special guest today. Um, my guest tonight is a clinically trained certified music therapist and director and co founder of a place to be. He's brilliantly creative and a super talented musician. Please help me virtually welcome my friend, Tom Schweitzer. What's up, Tom? Hey, Jason. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. I'm great. I'm thanks so much for you. Your... Yeah. Thanks so much for joining tonight. And um, I'm just going to launch into it. Let me, let's talk music. When did you first realize that music could be used to help people? Well, to be really uh, honest with you, the first time would have been when I was eight years old. Um, and I, uh, I was living in a small town in Pennsylvania, uh, a, a town I love very much still, named Altoona. And in my household, I was the only child. My dad was uh, severely schizophrenic and my mom was really sick. And there was a lot of, um, a lot of uh, anger and um, a lot of uh, uncertainty in my household. And when I was eight years old, one Sunday, I had the... I just had something inside of me, like a fire, something that told me that I needed to cross the street to our local church. And so we lived right across the street from a, um, a Methodist church. And on that day, I had enough of the screaming and the yelling and the fear. And I, I was still wearing my pajamas and I ran out my door ran across the street and I ran right up to the church and the church door was answered by a Sunday school teacher who was also a musician. And she took me in and I was there with her every Sunday for at least the next five years. And she was the person who taught me how to play the piano. She was the person that told me that I could sing and she would play so I could sing. So really, Jason, music saved my life when I was a child. And then years later, it's come, it's, it's come back into my life um, as not only my mission, but something I knew that I needed to give back to the world because somehow the world, God, whatever you believe in, gave it to me when I was a child. Wow. So you are taking from that um, very personal experience uh, as a young person, um, you recognize this connection to healing and music, and um, you're now this. This is something that you've uh, committed your your life to helping people uh, using music. What is um, you're a certified music therapist? Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? What is music therapy? Yeah, so, you know, if you don't know what music therapy is, you might think that we are really good musicians that like to make people feel better. And in a way, we are, but we're not. We are clinically um, trained. Everything is evidence-based, data-driven. Uh, to become a music therapist, the first thing you need to do is you need to go to school for four years to become a music therapist. We have, uh, you know, we have as many... Uh, psychology courses as any other therapist that's out there. Um, and then what we do is we use our music as a portal for this clinical work, no matter, no matter what your goal or objective is. If you're working with mental health or you're working with physicality, behavior, cognitive, our approach as musicians is to go at it in a very evidence-based, science evidence-based, data-driven clinical um, way. And we're trained uh, to be with a client or a patient and provide them a beginning and a middle and an end. And we use music as that thread. Wow. So when, when I was growing up um, playing guitar and loving all different types of music, uh, I could always find something in some style of music that resonated with me. Mm. And uh, sometimes that style didn't always resonate with my parents. For example, I remember a road trip where um, I was, um, you know, 
suggesting some music and I think uh, it was some some heavy metal at the time. It was likely some Metallica or Iron Maiden. And I think one of my CDs went uh, was recycled out the window at a high rate of speed. <laughs> But it got me thinking, for me, although that music didn't necessarily resonate or that particular song or whatever it was didn't necessarily resonate with my parents, I recall in those times, um, it was, it was, it did resonate with me and um, it helped me. I would listen to music when I was happy, when I was sad, and it would kind of create a, uh, um, you know, it worked. Is, is is Metallica, you know, therapeutic? Yeah. Kind of, I'm saying that in jest because, you know, I'm a Metallica fan and I know people listen to Metallica, but, you know, seriously. Well, I think you're bringing up the uh, one of the best attributes of music therapy, and that is that, is that we get to use the client's preference of music. So when they come to us and they tell us Metallica is our thing, and if you'd like me, I think you might have heard that story and I'm happy to say it. Um, you know, one of my most profound moments was with a client, a 16 year old young man who was completely off the charts, getting in trouble at school, being angry, being defensive, violent. And so his mother brought us to our music, brought him to our music therapy center and I met this mom out in the uh, lobby and she said, good luck. My son has not stayed in a psychiatrist, psychologist's office. He's gonna run from you. You will not even get two minutes with my son, but thank you for trying. So this big burly hair in front of his face looks really, you know, really frustrated and mad. Uh, young man comes into my uh, office and he sits on a, a couch. I sit on a chair. I don't say anything to him. All I ask is, what is your favorite music? And he says, you're not going to like it, but it's Metallica. And I said, okay. <laughs> so then I began to, you know, I went on my phone and I have my speaker on and, you know, I don't say another word as a therapist, but I pull up, you know, I pull up a little bit of this, you know, uh, here it is. And we listen to this music and we listen to that song, then the next song. And then by the third song, we're sort of like connecting. And I don't, I still don't say anything. I just kind of look at him like, mm, cool. You know, we go a whole 50 minutes. And, you know, as a therapist, I'm so elated and proud because mom told me I couldn't keep her son in my room for more than two minutes. And we get to the last song. We have sat there. We have looked at each other. We have listened to Metallica at nauseum, I have never listened, nothing against you, Jason. So we're done, and I look at him, and I, I, I say, well, we're done, thank you for coming. And you can see that this kid has tears in the bottom of his eyes. And I'm heading to the door to open it up. He looks at me, and he says, I don't wanna be the next school shooter. Wow. And I said, you don't have to be. I'll see you here next week. And the great part of this story is, you know, we're years later now. And he joined a band. He joined the band at high school. He graduated. And music therapy, we also worked very when, – when, when you have that sort of uh, mental health challenge, right, we don't work mm -hmm. alone. We, I worked very closely with his psychologist and his psychiatrist and his whole mental health team. So the point is when you were talking about your parents not loving your music and kind of throwing your CD out the window, Metallica at that point in your life was your preference. And preference of music makes it possible for the intervention of therapy to not be threatening. Mm. Like I love musicals. I love um, 
I love musicals. I love indie music. I love the eighties like you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I was in a place that somebody had to somehow connect to me and I was resistant from just speaking, if you played music that might relate to what I, what I feel close to, what I'm comfortable with, it's amazing how music just opens up this avenue of communication. So that's, that's one of our great benefits of, of using music therapy in the clinical setting. Wow, so you were able to uh, build rapport, you were able to build trust, and um, start the process of breaking down those walls to get inside of a person who was uh, reluctant to do so. And um, it was through a decision to simply start with listening to what he loved at the time, which was just happened to be Metallica. Could have been anything. Could have been, you know, anything. Um, wow, that's really uh, deep and incredible. And the part that is also important in that story, I think to me that stood out was the fact that um, you were able to recognize that this tool of music therapy could be augmented with other um, people within the medical profession to truly help this. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we only do what we do. Music therapists, we do not claim to be psychologists or psychiatrists or speech therapists. But the music lends itself to really, you know, not only touch, but sort of, um, uh, sort of awaken and uh, unearth and embrace many parts of the human system. So just being with other healthcare providers that provide specific um, therapeutic approaches, we can be right beside them. And literally with that case I was just talking about is, you know, I had to talk, I talked to his psychiatrist every week because he really was allowing me in and he was allowing the music to tell his story. That's another thing, Jason, is, you know, with this young man that I worked with, um, lyric analysis, taking a lyric, and we took a lot of the lyrics from Metallica, not all of them were fitting, you know, you know the lyrics, but when you can find lyrics that sort of correspond and relate to what your client is going through right now, uh, one of my favorite stories is um, when you find yourself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be, right? So I was working with um, a young man who has very intense OCD, right? But he was in love, and he still is in love, uh, with the Beatles. And so we came up with new lyrics to Let It Be, where um, we, I won't use his mom's real name, but we were like, Mother, I'll, I'll say her, her name was um, Caroline or Carol, okay? Mother Carol comes to you, right? We're changing the words enough that it connects to his reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a young man who would maybe wash his hands up to a half hour to an hour in the bathroom. This is very pre-COVID. And mm -hmm. plus, even if, yeah. if you're worried about COVID, you're not doing that. Yeah, I get it. I get he it. has yeah. intense obsessive compulsive disorder. So, you know, for years, uh, and it, 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 it seemed to really help when he found himself washing for more than two, three minutes, he would sing this song out loud to himself in the mirror. When I okay. find my hands washing too much, I ask, well, I don't know what the words are. Oh, no, 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 let it be. And we also use physicality for that. So every time we rehearsed or we worked in the music therapy intervention the, in the, in the um, session, every time we would do let it be, we would take our hands like this. Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. Then I would tell him to put his hands on his lap. 
whisper words of wisdom, let it be. Ah, okay. And so, so you're mixing uh, the uh, the different senses to connect with him, a memory sense to a uh, song that is very familiar. You're altering the lyrics slightly to be fitting to this yeah. situation, and you're using the physicality to actually literally get him to practice to keep his put his hands down in a moment where his hands were previously becoming compulsive and washing. It's doing another undesirable behavior. Completely. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You mix those sensories. You're getting his body to engage. You're getting his hands to stop. You're getting a song that he is, he's in love with the Beatles, but you're mm -hmm. changing the words just enough that they're his reality. And his That's mother, so cool. I mean, Years later, he came back to me and, and his mom would say it's working because she would see him go into the bathroom and then like, you know, five minutes later, you're hearing him sing. It's a tool. So yeah. we as music therapists, we want you to generalize what we give to you. And not everybody's an opera star. Not every mom and dad knows how to sing. Not everybody knows how to play an instrument. But we, if we can give you some tools by using music, to help you through your day, no matter what the what the ability, disability, the challenge, that's really our goal. That is so cool. I love un, sort of peeling back the onion of music because again, it's something that I've always loved and been around and to be able to see it uh, used as a tool to help people is so cool. And I don't think a lot of people, uh, are familiar with it. I don't think uh, a lot of people recognize. I think we know that we love listening to music and it helps us, but we uh, don't necessarily understand how deep it can go. You had some great examples in a recent uh, interview that I watched where you dove into some specific applications, uh, additional applications. Can you share some other sort of ways you use music as a clinical tool? Sure, sure. So, you know, I think what you're talking about is I talked about there are 12 notes in between an octave. That was C C. And in between the two C's, so if you see a piano, right? Here's a C, here's a C, and in between is... And the intervals between those notes... Every time you hear a specific interval, you can breathe on this, Jason. Right? There's an interval. That's called a major second. Now listen to the difference. Breathe in and just listen. What's happening? <laughs> right? Something's happening. Is that a sharp four? Yeah, this yeah, sort of this is this is uh, called a tritone. Yeah, I'm and, very uh, familiar. By the way, in yeah, uh, yeah. metal music, we love the tritone. We'll even call it the devil's tritone because really it has good? because it has such an ominous sound to it, and it's used to give you an ominous sort of feeling. And those that are listening, listen. Can you hear it? And uh, so in my music theater world, there was a person, uh, a writer who used it incessant, incessantly, of course, in his most famous musical, uh, West Side Story. Right? West Side Story, Maria. Now, now see how beautiful that is, right? Yeah. You yeah. just met a girl named Maria. But... Mostly in the in the music, you hear right. There's tension. There's tension. There's two gangs. <laughs> there's two gangs against each other. So that's an interval. Then there's the perfect fifth interval, which I talk about all the time. What song is that? Twinkle, twinkle. And people don't always know this. Twinkle, twinkle is the same thing. You just don't stop to think about it as A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Same tune. That's all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. The one I think I talked about there, too, was this is a major seventh. 
Now there was a musical, I'm always talking about musicals, right? But there's this musical called South Pacific. And she sings about this mysterious, beautiful island called Darling, I will call you. But really what this seventh is, this seventh is only one step away from resolving. And what we are trying to do most of the time with our clients is resolve something. So listen to this. And here's the resolve. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Yes. So yeah, intervals can be a lot. And they manipulate us. So when you're hearing, um, oh, let me see if I can play this. Oh, I forget how to play it. So from a very famous, um, let me see if I can pull it up because I, I don't. You all know this song. And this has a bunch of seconds in it. And when you use that interval of seconds, it really gives you this feeling of yearning. And, you know, trying to connect and, um, and one of the reasons that these seconds, these, these close notes work like that, like we want to hear her. There's a reason it's how we speak. We speak between seconds and thirds. So if I'm really telling you how I feel, I'm telling you just probably like this. Because when you're doing sevenths, you're pissed off or something's really wrong, you know? Uh, here, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you in a second. That is so cool. I've never thought of that. Um, I might not have thought of that actually till right now either. But this, like if I'm mad, right? We've heard people yeah, do this. Yeah. How can you? Sure. How can you? I mean, you have to like really jump. But when you're being intimate with somebody, what she's. Right? So she's right there, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you talk to someone, you're kind of staying here. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in all of these beautiful ballads, what happens? near far wherever you are then you're you get up. to the high notes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. You're up the, yeah. Sixth, the crescendo <laughs> it's a yeah it's the fireworks so, going off yeah yeah it's the fireworks going off and, and that is pretty much music is that manipulative it brings you and you you can listen now you know sometimes i don't give all of this these ideas out because it not that it ruins music, it kind of makes it more interesting than ever, but you won't listen to something again the same way because you're like, oh, they're kind of like staying here. Like, let it go. That, that's another great example. Like, why were children, people obsessed with Let It Go from Frozen for years? If you pull that song apart, she's really down in a lower register and she's telling you how she feels. And she's only singing within three notes. And then when it gets to the Let It Go, it's, let it go, let it go. And then she goes up and out. And so we all want to go with her. And that's yeah. that really is the true, beautiful manipulation that music has. I mean, there's a reason that in the 80s and the, the 90s, like in Kmart, they always played fast jazz music. I don't know if you remember this or not. I remember going to Kmart. Yeah. Keep the Blue Light Special, I'm right? With you. So yeah, of course. They were one of the first stores ever to play like background music, right? And it had this, just dun, 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 dun. it was like this jazz because it really made you want to be like, what do I need to buy? What, what do I have? What do I have to do? Just like wow. elevator music. And that was at the dentist, the doctor. Do you remember that music? It was. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or Muzak, as they called it. Right? Yeah. yeah. It yeah. was like this slow down pace of jazz that really yeah. you, couldn't, you couldn't even find a melody but it, it was, was like so being under anesthesia that's <laughs> right that's right exactly i think that's why they put it in the dentist office sure but sure. it's all around us i mean it's in an, and that's the beauty of it and if in this covid period of time too you know i've talked about this and i'm very very appreciative of the beautiful commercials that have been made uh, about what is going on. But if you listen to the music, it's always this very 
sparse, uh, minor key. Here's a here's a minor key. All you have to do is change one note and listen to the difference. This is major. You have not seen a COVID commercial like talking about what we've all been going through like this. Yeah. No. Right. 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 what we're going through. No, you hear. Here in this time together, we are all one. It's, it's there. And it music sets up what we are supposed to feel. Yeah, especially for those composers watching, that is exactly what music in film is designed to do, right? It is designed to let the audience know how they are supposed to feel when it isn't totally clear in the imagery. You sort of know without even knowing, but it helps you along the way. And yeah. it uses those, inter it, what's it, so interesting about this, Tom, is just what you're saying, in an, for those who aren't really into music, is the distance between the notes that mm -hmm. you choose to play. And it can be only two notes. That's the it. distance between those notes is enough to create an emotion. Yeah. So whether you're in music therapy, whether you're thinking about doing film composition, whether you're writing a pop song, all of these elements are critically important in all of those areas, I would say. Would you agree with that? Oh, Jason, you said it so well, and here's one that you know very well too. Now. So that's a minor, right? Of course, yeah. Darth Vader's theme song, right? Right? And, and you yep. know, you look at classical music, we heard this in um, Bach and Beethoven, right? Mm -hmm. When you hear... It's the same interval. It's just yeah. John, John Williams, everything that he creates, you know, he, Hans Zimmer... They're like these masters at doing what exactly what you said, creating um, the entire environment that all you have to do. I mean, Jurassic Park. You hear Jurassic Park and all of a sudden you're in a helicopter above, you know, those those dinosaurs or you're uh, you know, you're hearing the score of E.T. and you're like picking up Reese's pieces. They music brings us to where we need to be. And um, uh Many of these composers, like I know John Williams definitely is, inspired by classical music. There are so many phrases and motifs that are not stolen, but kind of inspired by what our classical, um, our classical uh, composers you know, created for us. I love that you said both of those composers, we've all heard their music, whether you know you've heard it or not. They're fantastic. They are the rock stars of the composer world. Hans Zimmer, uh, I love as well. Um, Dark Knight, Batman's uh, oh. Dark Knight, Inception. Um, so many. Um, if you know to even go into Hans Zimmer, he I believe was also in like a rock band in the eighties. Oh. Maybe not. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's the guy that did A Nightmare Before Christmas. Tim Burton, um, Danny Elfman. Uh, uh, Danny Elfman. Wasn't he in like Oingo Boingo or something? I don't know. We'll have to look that up. You used, you used Tom, some vocabulary words in a recent interview uh, that I'd like to dive into. I thought was fascinating because I love the psychology behind music. And one of those words was, uh, if I wrote it down right, entrainment. Hmm. Can you explain what that is and how that uh, connects music in a uh, clinical sure. environment? Yeah, so entrainment is um, when we, as the therapist, meet the, uh, the client where they are. And then we might be able to take them where they need to be. So if somebody, let's say somebody has anxiety, right? And they're like this, I'm talking and I'm here in front of my music therapist. And do you see what I'm doing right now as this person with anxiety? What I'm doing is I'm giving you rhythm, right? <laughs> And what we 
do is if that's where they are, we use music to be one with them and to try to um, try to entrain them, try to bring them to where they need to be. So this person, if they are sitting across from me, like, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I might stay with their breathing, right? Let's take a breath. Breathe out. Let's take a breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. Now look what I'm doing here. Let's take a breath. Oh, breathe in. Breathe out. So right here, I am taking this person with anxiety and negativity to a slower pace. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. They notice they have now slowed down their breathing. And we can speak like this. Maybe tell you what's really wrong. Then guess what happens? Oh, look, the sun has shined today. We just took them from a minor to a major. Yeah, let me just, uh, that was so awesome, Tom. So from a musician standpoint, what I heard you just do was mm -hmm. you had a, a client, another human being uh, in front of you that was in a high elevated state of anxiety. There was fast paced breathing. There was physiology that you noticed and you created a song. You didn't start with, hey, I'm going to go in the totally opposite direction and bring no. you happy. No. and try to get you way over from there to happy. You, you tried with music, you did with music, you matched their state Where in they the musical were. pacing, the tempo, as we call that. And also in, you'd mentioned it before, major and minor keys. Your first one was sort of minor. It was a yeah. little bit, in a sense, it felt chaotic. If you listen back to this, watch this again, listen to what he was playing. And then you were slowly bringing the tempo down. So what you're saying is entrainment is meet the client where they are. Meet the person in the state yeah, they are. that they're. And then slowly through approximations, bring use this musical tool to get them into another state. You started with the overall pacing, the yep. tempo. You brought them down. Now their breathing is calm. Then you changed the key. Yeah. You made it major. And right. if and you do that too quickly, they won't go with you. It's just like being with a friend and you're really depressed and you're down, right? Nobody <laughs> believes a friend. Like if I'm not feeling good and I'm kind of depressed and down, you're not really good. A friend who says, oh, come on. Hey, life's not snap so out of it. Right. Snap You're out right. of it. Oh, thanks. I've oh, snapped out of it. Yeah. I've snapped out of it. Thank you for that great advice. No, right. it never works that way. It, Jason, it's the same thing as empathy. So if you're looking at somebody and you can be in their shoes and I can see this person. Okay. They're here. I understand them. Oh, this must be horrible. And then with your empathy, you're like almost, you know, in really good entrainment is really like becoming one with your person. And you know, this is, you know, we're talking about music therapy, but this is actually something all of us need to get better at. Mm -hmm. When we have somebody we love, somebody we care about, somebody we're caring for, mm -hmm. to be with them. And I think, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, that's like one of the benefits that we're getting from this unreal surreal experience we're having with covid is because mm -hmm. it's almost like stopping us to have these moments that the little moments you do get with somebody not on zoom but well maybe on zoom but the, the little bit you get with somebody needs to mean so much and you have to listen i'll tell you the biggest quality i look for in a music therapy a music therapist is how they listen 
because you know this. You are you, Jason, are an excellent, amazing, creative type human being and great musician. And you know the key to music is listening. It's listening, and it's it's listening, and sometimes it's also the silence between the notes. And so, if you can't, if if everything was just clogged up. <laughs> there'd be nowhere to breathe. And sometimes we're working with somebody just for the silence. Because if I'm working with somebody and I'm trying to prompt a, a response, and I do this. Should I go on? It, and, do you see how that feels? Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. where were we going? What were we doing? And sometimes with um, like uh, the populations I work with in autism, mm -hmm. I might throw, they throw me off, I throw them off a little bit. Here's some stuff and then there's silence. And sometimes to reactivate the brain, Jason, the, the brain inside of all of us wants resolve. And they want, uh, our brain wants continuation of whatever it is feeling or hearing. So we're gonna go back to that seventh again, right? If I left that client just like that, how unresolved is that? Mm -hmm. You can't leave a client like this. Okay, have a great day. Hope you're feeling better. <laughs> it's very different to do this. Yeah. Have a good day. Yeah. Totally get it. Musical resolution. Yep. Literally part of music theory, the concept of resolution. Totally. It's all, and all of this is. And I, I, I can't tell you that I got straight A's in music theory, Jason, but all of this is about music theory. All of it is about the math, the connection, the disconnection, the, the congruency, the, um, the, the relationship between the notes, between the music, the dynamics, the tempo. And that is, that's who we are as humans. We're, we're, we have the same, we have a tempo. We have dynamics, we have pauses. You know, some of the greatest speakers in the world, and you know this very well, we listen to and believe them because they have that pause. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's the same in music. It's really, uh, when you start to relate music to everything that you see around us, down to, um, you know, and I think you know this, uh, but there's something called mother ease. So mother ease is the sound mothers make with their babies. So mother ease, you've all heard it. Mother ease is, oh, oh, my, look, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does the baby do? It reacts, it smiles, it connects. So um, there have been many studies done that in orphan uh, orphanages, and for children who have not had stimulation or sensory stimulation of any kind, how, how that affects and disturbs um, the, the growth of the brain and the emotional growth of that little baby of that, because they don't have a bonding. They don't have, mm -hmm. they don't have that mom above them with those big eyes to go, oh, look. And that is the, 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 the actual clinical scientific uh, word that we use is mother ease. And it's, it's um, mother talk. And um, we, we, we also do a little bit of that with our pets, right? Hey, how are you? And if you think about it, what I just did there is all music. I'm going up here and talking down here. Because if I, if Hazel's sitting over there right now, if, if I was to say to Hazel, you know, come here, baby, come here, come here, hear all those notes, mm -hmm. listen to the difference. Come here, Hazel, come here, come here. I'm, I'm robotic. Yeah. And so we as humans, we're different than Alexa. 
were different than Siri. They have tried to give Siri and Alexa, you know, some pitches. So you feel like, oh, I'm really talking to a person. But you know, I tried to listen to an audio book last night that I really wanted to hear. And I was like, oh, my, but it's like 3,000 pages. And um, the only audio book they have is of a computerized voice. <laughs> and I oh, gave man. pages and I was like, you know, and then in the beginning of time, there was, and the reason is there's no musicality yeah. to the voice. Yeah. And that is why you and I used to fall asleep when we had a fifth grade teacher who was, remember this word? Oh my God, that teacher so monotone. Monotone, yep. Yeah. They're teaching yeah. like this because there's no lift, there's no fall. That means that there's no engagement into like, I'm not that interested then. Oh, wow. So all of this yeah. that we've talked about tonight, really, it's all about music, but it's amazing when you take all the components of music and then apply it to just being human. Wow. I want to ask you about uh, if you have any um, practical ways that uh, any of us can use music in our own lives to lift our spirits during this uh, difficult time. I also want to talk to you a little bit about a place to be before before I let you go tonight. And um, But if you could start, are there some practical things we can do at home, even if we're not musicians, um, to... During this difficult time. Yeah, the first thing I would say is get an app. Get get uh, my favorite is Spotify. Make yourself a playlist. Mm. Think of the first song that you remember. The, hmm. Like uh, somebody asked me, I always ask people that, and somebody asked me that back. And you know, my first song that I remember was Zippity Duda, but it was from the oh Disco Duck Disney record that I had like when I was seven. And I pulled it up. You can't even believe what that brought back. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, good memory. Also, some not like I was like, I thought about my where my parents were and the house. and But it brought back so much. And then it opened up this portal. I was like, what did I listen to when I was 10? So I would say there are a couple of things. One, think about the songs from your past that meant something. And number two, like I think you should have a playlist that makes you feel, and you should make a playlist for yourself that makes you dance. And I don't mean that you always have to get up and dance, but you're cooking food, get some music that makes you kind of want to move when you're cooking. And you know, I, I told you, I think I told you this story, uh, or I said it out loud maybe to you, you know, there was this uh, uh, lady I was working with, and she's like going through COVID like all of us. And she's like, I'm cooking my meals, and I get so sad. And I said, I want you to turn on some dance music. Like, I mean, club dance music or disco or whatever you love. And she got back to me, and she said, um, I, Macho Duck, Brian, absolutely. Um, macho, Macho Duck. So this woman started to dance as she was making her dinner. And she called me and she said, Tom, I had the greatest time, but I have to be honest with you, I started to cry. We have to remember when our emotions, and if music helps us to get there, when our emotions are lifted, there's a very fine line between elation and also tears. Because you know that there has been times in your life that you have laughed so hard you have cried. And there have been times in your life that you have cried so much and things are so out of control and you can't even imagine them that you start to laugh. Music has the ability to help us heighten our emotions. So when we're feeling like, oh, I don't really feel like just cutting onions and making a steak, dance, dance in your kitchen. So those are my two uh, points of advice, Jason, is like make a play miss, uh, playlist that makes you feel, makes you cry, makes you think, makes you reflect, and then do another one that's nothing but just crazy fun. 
I love it. I love it. I've been so enthralled in what you were saying, Tom. I forgot to look at our comment section. I just want to give a shout out. Thank you, Brian, for watching and Adam. And Ellie Rose said it was so fascinating. I threw that up on the screen while you're giving that oh. explanation. So it's so great to have you, Ellie, joining us tonight. And Brian Ellie is Macho Duck. That was on that album, Brian. <laughs> that's it. And then he also added Boogaboo. Huh? <laughs> so there you go. Oh, that is uh, great, great uh, information. We we haven't even talked about A Place to Be. So you are the creative director and co-founder of an organization called A Place to Be that I've been fortunate enough to be able to um, donate some of my time and contribute to and uh, tr uh, support in my own little way. And it is such an amazing organization. And now it is... it. It was based in Middleburg, Virginia, and now you are literally worldwide with some of your virtual programming. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So we are in our 10th year. This is our 10th anniversary. We are a nonprofit organization here in Northern Virginia. We are called a place to be. We help people navigate. Uh, we help people face, navigate, and overcome life's challenges through music therapy. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, during COVID especially, we have reached out to hundreds of different families who are in need, especially of um, uh, releasing anxiety and stress and depression. And um, we, uh, we also have a performance uh, component of our organization where our individuals who um, are music therapy clients get up on stage and they perform productions that um, remind everybody that we're human. And the focus there is acceptance, diversity, and the spread of empathy. So yeah, we're, we're in a very exciting 10th year. And you know, COVID has definitely made us kind of pivot and, and, and figure out who we are next, but we are really excited to come back. And you know, we definitely will, um, be stronger when it comes to the teletherapy uh, part of our organization. But yeah, we're, um, we're a really strong uh, mission-driven center and we look forward to the future. And Tom, you have uh, an incredible team of music therapists that you work with. And uh, I know I've had the opportunity to meet quite a few of them. And you're doing virtual sessions right now through Zoom with cl clients. Um, really all over the place. Uh, for those people who want to learn more about A Place to Be, want to uh, explore the um, uh, video uh, virtual side of things, uh, and or even would like to donate and support your cause, uh, I'm going to throw up on the screen some uh, contact information there. That's Well, that's my contact information. Here we go. Cool. So to follow Tom and A Place to Be, um, there's uh, your Facebook and... Um, uh, Instagram handle and uh, place to be.org is kind of the center for all the information there. Yeah, place to be va.org is our website. And if you want to donate, you can go there. Or if you want to learn more about who we are, um, and, and if, if you even browse our website at this point, um, of course, in the last few months, uh, we've updated. Um, we are having our summer camps now online, uh, Zoom camps. But, but even if you're somebody that's interested in music uh, therapy, I think our site would give you at least um, a beginner's view of what music therapy can do, especially when it comes to music therapy and performance. Jason, yeah. it's great to be with you tonight. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to, I'm, you know, time flies when we're uh, having so much fun discussing all these different points. And one of the... Um, one, someone who I met through a place to be, uh, Brendan, who we both know and who is uh, the voice of a place to be, and also was the voice that you heard at the very intro of this live session. I'd love to give him a plug if that would be okay for you. He is a wonderfully talented voiceover artist. And uh, so let me just play this real quick and then we'll wrap up. I'm Brendan Frederick, professional voiceover artist and the voice of A Place To Be. If you need voiceover assistance for your project, please leave a comment below and I'll follow up. We Isn't that awesome? Oh my God, we're all big fans of uh, Brendan. And uh, yeah, you know, some people are born with that kind of a voice and he is. 
And thank you for helping him, Jason. And also, sure. uh, you, you mentioned something earlier. Thank you for the time that you have given to A Place to Be and the summers you have worked with us. I think you are, um, you know, you keep on uh, surprising me. It took a couple, I know, I know you as the person who does an amazing job at Dolphin Quest, but it took many years to understand um, your extreme talent when it came to music production, your interest in, um, you know, your interest in uh, being innovative in the world of music. I mean, I, I, I never even heard the word found sounds until it was with you. And your patience and your love for our clients at A Place to Be has uh, not been, uh, not been, not noticed. We, we have noticed what you have given to our young people and we uh, love working with you. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. That means a lot. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. It's been a ton of fun. And I hope that in the future, uh, you'll come back and spend some more time on the show. Uh, there's so much to talk about, and I really appreciate it. So thank you very much, Tom. Thank you for uh, having me tonight, and uh, thank you all for watching. All right. Bye now. Bye. See you. Thank you.